to how to get started hacking NetBSD. Um, for those of you who just entered, uh, you can find the slides, uh, a copy to follow at your own pace at this URL, uh, this QR code. I'm going to leave this up for a couple more seconds if you want to take a quick photograph of it. Um, and uh, yeah, so this, this, this is about uh, how I got started hacking NetBSD and um, how you can get started too and some tips for how to do some basic uh, development, debugging, diagnostics uh, in, in NetBSD to get you started so you don't get stuck with a mysterious panic and no idea how to proceed. Um, so the first step for getting started is to check out the source code. Uh, you can use CVS, which is what we store the master uh, copy of the source code in. There's also a Git mirror and a Mercurial mirror. Uh, we may soon be transitioning to one of these, but uh, that's all I'll say about that right now. Once you have the um, uh, source code, you can use build.sh. Uh, this is a uh, wrapper for the build system that will build everything you need. It will build a cross-compiler tool chain. It will build all the other tools that you need, like a, you know, ASN1 compiler to build Heimdall and uh, whatever else. Uh, and then it will build the kernel and the user land and distribution sets and the release image, live image, everything, uh, all in one command line. It will take a little while. Um, if you have a really fast machine, you might be done by the time this, this talk is over. Um, you can race, go. So how, how did I get started hacking NetBSD? Well, um, back in the early 2000s, I, I lived in the Apple world. Uh, and, uh, you know, I had a PowerBook, uh, uh, PowerBook G4, um, and uh, there were various things that, that bothered me, but one thing that, that really especially um, upset me was um, that uh, Apple pushed out a software update that would block you from running a debugger on, on certain applications. Um, this, this, I was kind of offended by this denial of autonomy to have control over what my own computer is doing. It's my own CPU, I bought it, I, I own the CPU, and it's executing software of my choice, but for some reason, some of this software is not allowed to look at what's going on on the CPU that I bought. Uh, and I, I found that, that very offensive. Um, uh, so uh, I, I started shopping around for, for something, something better, um, something that would, uh, that would respect my autonomy. Um, and uh, there was a constraint, though, which is that I didn't have a lot of uh, money on hand to buy new computers, so I wanted something that would also run on my PowerBook G4. Uh, that narrowed it down quite a lot. Um, and, you know, I, I checked out some Linux systems, other BSDs, uh, but I was able to uh, cross-build NetBSD from, uh, well, I had a MacBook and a PowerBook, a Mac, Intel MacBook, one of the very first generation. The, Apple actually did some 32-bit Intel um, uh, MacBooks. I had one of those. And I was able to cross-build NetBSD on that 32-bit Intel MacBook for the PowerPC G4. And it just worked. I ran those two commands, CVS checkout and build.sh, and, and it just worked. It took a while, but it just worked. Um, and uh, so I went and... Uh, Tried it out, did an installation. This is the first email that I ever sent uh, in the NetBSD world, um, reporting my experiences uh, running NetBSD on the PowerBook G4. Uh, I was a little more long-winded then than I, I like to think I am now, um, but the, the email is a lot longer than this. This is the first two paragraphs that kept going. Um, and then within a week, uh, two weeks or so, I found my first kernel bug. Um, I was trying to use uh, RxVT Unicode, URxVT, a terminal emulator, and I was trying to use it in the uh, client-server mode because the PowerBook G4 didn't have a lot of RAM, so I didn't want to have uh, lots of copies of all the fonts loaded into, into RAM. Um, and so with URXVT, you can run one terminal server, and then uh, a bun it, will, it create, can create as many clients as you want. Each one is a terminal window, and it reduces the memory usage a lot. And it, in order to do this, it has to pass file descriptors over a socket which is this extremely crafty Unix API, the C message API, if you've ever dealt with it. It's, it's a huge pain. Uh, you basically have to read the Stevens book and copy and paste exactly the strange sequence of incantations around C message header level, message buffers, space, len, whatever, in order to get it to work right. Except that even then, it didn't quite work right, right on NetBSD PowerPC. It worked okay on x86, but not PowerPC. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is an alignment bug. Uh, and so I figured, okay, well, I picked up the kernel for the first time. I'd never read any kernel source code before. I had no experience in this. I'd never taken any classes on operating systems. I just figured, it's C code. How hard could it be? And I opened it up, and I guessed how syscalls are implemented. 
and I went digging around and I found some questionable things in the C message implementation. Uh, and uh, I proposed a fix, and within a few days it was committed by uh, Christos. And that was great. I could, I, I, not only did I have autonomy over my computer, I could actually find bugs and find fixes and fix them, and they went in. And that, that, was, a, that was a great experience for me. Um, well, okay, it didn't quite get fixed until a while later because it turns out passing file descriptors over a socket is hard and it's complicated and there's lots of things that can go wrong in that. Um, but uh, th that's, that's, that's a story for another day. By the way, if I am talking too fast, feel free to let me know or you know, raise your hand. Or I, I don't know, just let me know. I, if I get excited, I, I, I sometimes start talking to pass a little too fast for me. Um, so uh, then there was another snag with my power book, which is that the Wi-Fi wasn't supported. Uh, everything else basically worked fine. Uh, just Wi-Fi and suspend did, didn't, didn't, didn't work. So I, um, uh, I thought, okay, well, let me see, try if I can, see if I can figure out what kind of driver I need. And I poked around and did some research and I found that the BWI driver from uh, OpenBSD and Dragonfly uh, was supposed to apply to the same kind of device, the same PCI IDs. I, I looked around at what the D message said, asked some people for help, and, and um, and found that the BWI driver was supposed to work. So it uh, was supposed to uh, uh, support this, this, this Wi-Fi card, this uh, Apple Airport Extreme. And um, so I thought, okay, well, this more C code, right? How hard could it be? Um, and I picked up the BWI code and I copied and pasted it and I went through line by line trying to figure out what does this mean in NetBSD, what does this mean in OpenBSD, what does, or what does it mean in Dragonfly and OpenBSD, and how do I say it in NetBSD, and asking for help, and you know, just going through. And, and, uh, and after a couple of months of working on this in my spare time, uh, by golly, it sort of worked. I was able to get packets flowing on, uh, uh, on, on Wi-Fi. Um, I mean, it sort of worked. I, I didn't do a great job because I'm not a Wi-Fi expert, and maybe someday I should go back and do a better job of you know, fix whatever bugs I left there. I, I, it's been, I, don't, I don't use this hardware anymore, so it's not as relevant, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, I just, you know, I, I picked a specific problem that I, I wanted to address, which is to get Wi-Fi working, and, and then I just drove, in, drove into that. Um, and, and in some sense, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention here. You get to, it's, it's very, very educational to pick a problem and then, and then just figure out what's going on on the way to, to solving that problem. Even if you don't solve the problem in the end, you probably learn a lot along the way. So how do you get started? Uh, well, you check out the source tree. Uh, you, uh, again, CVS or Git or, or Mercurial, uh, whichever you like. And then you um, run build at sh. Now this looks like a lot of weird command line options. Uh, you don't actually need all of them, uh, but uh, I'll just run through quickly what these, what these are. Uh, they're fairly straightforward. Um, dash o dot dot slash obj just means put all the build products in this directory. It will never touch the source tree. You don't have to worry about cleaning out your source tree later, get clean, or the CVS equivalent, which doesn't exist, uh, or anything like that. Just everything goes in dot dot slash obj. Uh, if you want to, you know, start a clean build, just move it out of the way. Um, dash u, with uppercase u, is an unprivileged build. Traditionally, uh, back in the, you know, days of yore, uh, you would have the source code in slash user slash source, and you would build in slash user slash obj, and uh, you would only build privileged because if you're doing development, of course you have root, and that's, you know, this is, yeah. Um, these days, uh, doing privileged builds is a little bit silly. I mean, there's no reason that you need, the, the, the build system needs access to, you know, kernel memory and device drivers and, and whatever, so you can do unprivileged builds. Um, it might even be the default now. Someone might have changed that. I don't know, I just have this wired into my fingers. Um, a dash, dash little u means an update build, so if you change a single source file, uh, it will pick up where it left off uh, and do an incremental build, doesn't clean everything. Uh, dash m alpha, this means build for the DEC alpha architecture, which I'm sure all of you have in your living rooms uh, at home. Um, you can pick any, any architecture you want here. You can build it as a list arch to list the options. Uh, dash n1 just makes it a little less verbose, doesn't show all the command lines. Um, you don't really need to see all the C preprocessor flags, dash d, netbsd source equals one, dash d, blah, 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 blah. If you want to read it, you can, you can omit dash n1 or pass dash n2 or dash n3, whatever. And um, dash j4 makes it a four-way parallel build. If you have, you know, four cores or even eight, eight threads on four cores, dash j4 is a reasonable choice. Uh, if you want to keep on browsing the web while you're, while you're doing that. Um, pick whatever parallelism you want, and then build that, that sh release builds a whole release. That is the NetPC kernel, uh, the tool chain, the kernel, the user land, uh, the distribution sets, and release images, live images, install images. Just does everything. 
Um, you can, you can also, there are also other targets like distribution, which just builds user land, tools, just builds a tool chain. Um, so when you do a release build, uh, you'll wind up with a few directories in the output. Uh, you'll wind up with a cross-compiler tool chain. Um, you don't have to use this uh, directly, but it will come in handy later. And if you uh, go to my, the talk I just gave yesterday uh, in the future, um, then uh, you can see that this is relevant for package source cross-compilation. Uh, you can use this to cross-build package source packages as well. Um, then uh, in the uh, release dir, there are some release products like the distribution sets, base.tgz, uh, you know, etsy.tgz, comp.tgz, and so on, and kernels that have been built, uh, as well as installation media and live, uh, uh, live media, like a live, live image. You can just boot up and there's NetBSD running, uh, full, full system installed. Um, in destadir, that's where all of the files that go into a NetBSD distribution are staged. Um, so. Uh, this is the traditional destitor concept. Uh, you can even root into the destitor. Uh, that'll come in handy later. Um, but uh, uh, that's, that's where you find the yeah, full NetBSD installation just in a non-slash directory. Um, and in various other directories, uh, like obj slash user dot bin slash find, that's where the find program has its .o files, has its, has its, build, has its build tree. Uh, and finally, uh, you can find the kernel under a, a somewhat deeper chain of directories, uh, sys, arch, dollar machine, compile, generic. Um, and this, uh, this, has, this is where the kernel.o files go and where the kernels themselves uh, get built. And sometimes it's called netbsd, sometimes netbsd.ub, sometimes netbsd.image. It, it varies from port to port, from you know, whether you're on ARCH64 building for a uh, you know, FDT system or building for something else. Um, some other useful targets. Uh, you can just build the tool chain if you want, if you just want to have a you know, cross C compiler, um, or just the user land if you don't care about rebuilding all the kernels, uh, or just the distribution sets once you've already built the user land, uh, or if you want to build the kernel modules. Um, there's a bunch of different uh, commands for um, uh, other operations. Yes, there's a question. Uh, the question is, when you build a release, why do you need to build a cross-compiler toolchain? Um, so if you uh, use build.sh release, you don't need to use any of these uh, uh, commands. Release implies tools, distribution sets, modules, kernel, et cetera. Um, if you just want the toolchain, and you don't want, like, it's, let's say you're doing kernel development, and you just want to rebuild a kernel over and over, you want to you know, iterate development of a kernel, you need a toolchain first, so you can build a toolchain, and then just build the kernel and skip the user land altogether. Skip the sets, skip the modules, all that stuff. Um, but if you're building a whole release with the kernel, user land, distribution, uh, um, uh, release images, live images, et cetera, then build it as H release does all of that. You don't need to use the finer grained operations. Um, so, right, if you're, so if you're just doing the kernel development, uh, then you can use uh, the kernel equals generic uh, build it as h command to build just one kernel with the kernel configuration generic. There's a few different kernel configurations um, for each port. Um, usually there's going to be an install kernel that is very stripped down. It is just enough to run the tiny installer image, and that has to fit in you know, very small spaces like floppy disks traditionally. Actually, we, we still use floppy disks in a sense uh, for our... Um, release engineering test bed, uh, we run automatic tests by running the installer out of virtual floppy disks um, on a 32-bit x86 uh, emulator. Uh, and uh, we have a bunch of different test beds. One of them use, does this. Uh, and uh, we, you know, so we, we still exercise the floppy disk path, um, even if it's a little archaic uh, to our ears. And then there are other kernels, like the generic one is what you usually want to be running on your laptop, on your server, whatever. Um, but sometimes there are, there are you know, board-specific kernels for s relatively small evaluation boards or, 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 or what have you. Um, um, custom kernel configs. Um, the kernel configuration has lists all the drivers, all of the kernel build options, and, and things like, you know, do you want to have debugging enabled? Do you want to have lock debug enabled, which is very expensive? Do you want to have you know, kern hist enabled so you can get a retroactive history of a, a bunch of events that happened even after the system crashes? Um, so there's a bunch of different uh, options you can, you can add for debugging. Uh, if you put a um, generic.local file in your kernel config directory, um, that will be automatically included by the generic kernel um, when you build a new one. And so you can just add um, 
uh, additional options. Or you can create your own uh, uh, config file called debug, let's say, that includes the generic one and enables uh, some options. Um, so I, I, I use both of these from time to time. Um, usually I have, you know, if I'm doing development on some, some uh, driver, I'll in, put it in generic.local, and then in, in my debug kernel, I'll have all the extremely heavyweight debug options enabled. In my generic kernel, I won't have them enabled. And if something goes wrong in the generic kernel, I try the debug kernel and try to track it down uh, when, a, when a crash happens or when a, you know, if the hang happens, see if lock debug catches a, um, uh, catches a mutex mistake. Uh, oh, um, let me get rid of that annoying bar at the bottom. There we go. That looks better. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's say you want to um, boot NetBSD in QMU. Um, well, you can uh, just build an image with build.sh release, and uh, that will give you in the release dir a file called uh, arm64.image.gz. This is a bootable image. You can just load it into QMU. Um, and uh, you can, let's say, create a, a second disk but with DD um, that uh, is, is sparsely, uh, sparsely populated. Um, oh, sorry, not create a second disk. You can, you can, you can expand it into a uh, 10 gig image so that when it boots, it will have space on the file system. It's, it's a live image, but it's, it's very compact. So there's no, no free space in it. When it boots, after you do this, it will expand into the 10 gig space. And uh, then you can you know, store files on your file system uh, this way. Um, and then you can make a symlink to the kernel so that when you run QMU, if you're doing kernel development, anytime you rebuild the kernel, QMU will just pick up the, the new one you just built. Um, so you can run QMU with a series of options. Uh, usually what I do is I just put these options into a shell script so I don't have to type them out every single time. Um, but uh, this just says, uh, please boot the kernel symlink that I just created and uh, add a, uh, uh, tell it what root uh, disk device to boot from. Um, dash M vert means this is QMU's virtual machine uh, as opposed to trying to emulate a very specific piece of real hardware. Um, the CPU, Cortex-53, just what kind of CPU is this, the CPU architecture. SMP, run two, two different, pretend there's two CPUs, gig of RAM, uh, add a disk and uh, make it a virtile block device. That's the, the, the you know, simplest, fastest way to do things. Make sure to add a virtile RNG device so that the, uh, if you're doing anything that actually matters on the, um, uh, inside the, the VM, if you want to do stuff on the internet that, that matters, you can have entropy for cryptography. Um, and then you might want to have network access with dash NIC. And you know, maybe you want to do it either with a serial console um, instead of graphical. Actually, I think, I don't know what happens if you write without dash no graphic in this one, but um, there's a sim similar thing on like x86. The, you can have a graphical or, or serial, whatever. Um, on some ports, the dash kernel option does not work to pass through a uh, kernel image. Um, it does work on uh, alpha, on ARM, both 32-bit and 64-bit ARM, uh, and on RISC-V and a a relatively new one, VIRT68K, uh, a very advanced technology in NetBSD. We have a, a virtual 68K port, um, makes, makes development easier. <laughs> All the 68K development's happening. <laughs> um, yeah, one person wanted to make it work, so he did, and uh, now it works. Uh, uh, it does not yet work on x86. The QMU-kernel option does not yet work on x86. Um, uh, we have a patch set in progress that there was a talk about just earlier today. Um, it's going to get merged real soon now, real soon now with a TM trademark. Um, but <laughs> yes, real soon. Um, uh, but if this doesn't work, there are a couple of ways you can get around that. Um, one, if you're on NetBSD, you can use either the VND driver, that is uh, um, uh, a, a, a virtual disk based on a local file to mount the, file, the root file system of the, Q, the, the, the virtual image and then edit the file system uh, from, from the host. Or you can use rump FFS. Uh, this is a way that you can use a user land process to mount a file system. Um, it does a similar, similar thing. Um, alternatively, you can uh, serve the kernel from the host with a simple HTTPD. Uh, just, there's a one built into NetBSD. You can just uh, uh, host the uh, one directory, the kernel build directory, and then download it in the virtual machine image uh, with FTP. Um, but soon, uh, this will be not necessary because we're going to merge the page change to let you use dash kernel with uh, x86. There's a question. Yeah, so it's like that, like, that there's a possibility that the uh, dash kernel doesn't work. So if you don't do this and you are interested in this part, if the uh, if, if, if anyone else like putting that on your uh, hard disk, then that's like the, the system 
Uh, I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? So, uh, in case that we don't want to use this last kernel, can we use the second, can we move the uh, kernel image on, like, uh, on a hard disk and then just, just do the tablet uh, creating uh, uh, the BIOS way of uploading the kernel onto uh, I mean, so the question is, can you just, if, if dash kernel doesn't work, can you uh, just boot from a normal installation image that has a kernel inside it? And the answer is yes, that's what's going on with, uh, uh, with with um, uh, these suggestions here, it's just the the, the virtual machine image, the the the, um, the disk image that we created earlier on, that can have a kernel in the root, um, and if you know, uh, uh, and it will boot just like a, a normal installation uh, slash netbsd is in the in the root file system is that's the kernel that it will that the, the bootloader will boot, and you can just update that in the VM. Um, it, Um, if you start with, let's, let's say, the x86 live image, then there is already a bootloader in that that will, yeah, you, you, can, you can use the x86 live image in QMU, and that has a bootloader and the kernel inside the image. And, right, and, you, and then, you can, then you can launch that and run FTP inside that VM to update the kernel inside the image, just like a, a normal NetBSD installation on a real computer, on a physical computer. Um, now, if you have a QMU system running and you're doing kernel development, uh, sometimes you'll find you know, the kernel crashes and it crashes in some horrible way, you don't know how to debug. Um, well, you can run GDB on the live QMU system. Um, you, you just have to pass the dash S argument to uh, QMU. Um, that's short for dash GDB TCP 1234. Um, and then inside GDB, uh, you can connect to QMU uh, with the target remote uh, command. And then you just have GDB running on the, the live kernel in, in your virtual machine. And this is really handy for like printing out data structures uh, when you have no idea how, how, did this, you know, how did this rooting table get into this state that it's in? What does it even look like? What is this, this tree structure? You can just use GDB print to print out regular, regular uh, C structures. And it will recognize the debug data from the kernel image. Um, uh, and you can do all standard GDB things. Um, you can even do this on a, the live kernel you're running on, as long as you don't have the uh, secure level raised. Um, you know, for a machine that's in production, you might want to raise secure level to, uh, you know, to one or two. Um, but if, the, if you're doing development on a, on a system, uh, you can connect GDB to a live kernel. No QMU, no virtualization involved. This is just GDB on the kernel memory. Uh, you run GDB on your uh, NetBSD kernel image and then target KVM to dev mem. Uh, KVM is not the Linux virtualization thing. This is a uh, kernel virtual memory library. Um, and then you, get, you can print out the you know, information with the GDB process if you want. Just look, up, look it up in the process table and uh, print out data structures as you watch them change as, as, you, uh, as, you're, as you keep using the kernel. It doesn't suspend the kernel. The kernel keeps running, uh, but you can, you can examine memory inside it as, as you go. It's very handy. Also kind of scary from a security perspective, but handy. <laughs> um, if you get a kernel crash dump, um, then you can load that into GDB or into a program called Crash, um, which is uh, a user land uh, version of DDB, the in-kernel debugger. Uh, the Crash command does not crash your system. It examines a crash dump. This is an important point of confusion that we maybe should have thought of when we picked the name, although I think the name came from a much earlier debugger many, many years prior. Um, I'm seeing some nodding in the back from, uh, yes. Um, so, uh, but in any case, uh, GDB is great for looking at data structures, um, uh, but there are some things it's, it, it takes some, some more work to get, to get, get out of it uh, that Crash knows about better. Um, Crash is good for getting um, uh, stack traces on any of the threads or CPUs in the system that were uh, running when the, when the crash dump happened. It's also good at looking at like the process tables. We could maybe adapt GDB to figure that out by writing some GDB scripts, but Crash is, is pretty handy. Uh, you know, it already knows how to do a bunch of this stuff. Uh, you can look at the DDB man page uh, for more commands available in Crash. Also, it's often useful to just look at the kernel message buffer, the, the console output with a dmessage command, and you can get that out of a core dump too, kernel core dump. Um, sometimes that's enough to figure out what happened. It just, you'll see a stack trace at the end, and oh, pff, I see what happened there. See the assertion failed, and you realize that, oh, I made this data structure invariant wrong or something. 
Um, it's also good to verify when you're doing development on a, on a machine that core dumps actually work, because core dumps are great, they have lots of diagnostic information in them, but sometimes they're broken. If you don't have a swap partition that is configured as a dump device, then core dumps will not work. If your you know, disk doesn't work when the kernel is crashing, then core dumps don't work. And so you can um, use the uh, debug.crashme syskernel nodes to simulate a system crash. This is how you crash the system, not by running the crash command, by running syskernel-w debug.crashme. That actually does crash the, the, the system. Uh, and um, there's a few different ways to do it. Uh, you can use crashme to uh, simulate a panic as if the kernel had called the panic function. Uh, you can ask it to just enter DDB directly, uh, and then you get a debugger prompt uh, at the console. Uh, it can also, you can ask it to like recursively lock a mutex, which is forbidden. NetBSD mutexes are non-recursive. Um, this is an explicit design decision in the API. Um, you can have it enter an infinite loop with interrupts blocked. Uh, in NetBSD current and soon in 11, um, maybe, might, might even backport this to 10, I don't know, it's very handy, uh, there is a heartbeat that where every CPU is checked on by at least one other CPU to make sure it's made progress in the last 15 seconds. Um, and so if one CPU enters an infinite loop with interrupts blocked, it will never have progress. And so another CPU will say, ah, ah, heartbeat, this, this patient's dead, and uh, panic. Um, or you can launch Golang, which is a well-known third-party test suite for that PC kernel. Um, <laughs> no, CrashMe doesn't do that. You have to launch Golang yourself outside CrashMe. Um, another good way to uh, uh, check, th check on, you know, if things are working is run an ATF test. This is uh, part of the NetBSD distribution in the tests distribution set. Um, it's, it's an optional part of the install, but you, when you install it, then you can uh, run, there's uh, thousands, possibly tens of thousands of tests that uh, get run. Um, they're, they're uh, you know, they exercise all, all corners of the, of the system. Well, not all corners, some parts are too old for ATF tests and some parts are, we haven't gotten tests for yet. But there's, there's a lot of tests here, they're very extensive. Um, we also have a, a website at relenge.npst.org uh, that shows uh, automatic test runs on a variety of different uh, uh, pieces of hardware, real hardware, virtual hardware, many different architectures. Um, during development, it's good to check on that, if you're an NPC developer, to check on that from time to time to see if your commits broke anything. Um, you can also run ATF tests unprivileged, um, and this is, this is nice because the privileged ones will exercise some dicey corners of the kernel. They'll, they might use, try to use some device drivers or use some kernel APIs that uh, can have destructive effects or you know, change the network configuration. The unprivileged ATF tests don't do any of that, so there's fewer tests, but they still exercise a lot of the system um, because we have um, uh, a lot of te kernel tests are built in user land with rump, which lets you uh, run kernel components um, in, in user land. A little more on that in a, in a moment. Um, I, I like to, to uh, save the output from this so I can page through it later. Um, this is just a handy command line that I, that I often use when I'm running stuff. Uh, you can run tests in a subdirectory too, like you wanna, you're doing some development on the math library to change the accuracy of the arcsine function, which I was doing recently. Um, actually a single float arcsine function. Um, and you can just you know, run that in a subdirectory and, and you'll get test results just from that uh, one, one component. Um, you can also, uh, instead of booting a VM and running ATF tests in a VM, uh, which you, know, you have to keep the, the VM image synchronized with your development image, you can also just root into the destitur directly as long as the kernel that you're running on the, the host NetBSD system. This only works on NetBSD, NetBSD, not from like a Linux host. But as long as the kernel um, is uh, at least as new as the user land you're trying to root into, uh, this will work fine. You just have to mount a couple of file systems and make sure that the slash dev nodes are there. If you forget the make dev step, you will find some things don't seem to print output and it's very confusing and then you'll find several gigabyte file called slash dev slash null, which is not supposed to be a several gigabyte file. <laughs> Where all the output's been going because you forgot to run make dev. Um, and then you can, you can run, uh, run, run tests in that. I do this all the time when I am uh, taking some changes on the uh, on NetBSD current in the development branch and preparing them for pull-up to co go into a NetBSD release into like 10.1 um, or 9.4 or 9.5. Um. 
If you want to develop one library or one program at a time, you can just CD into the directory for the source code for that uh, program or library and use the, uh, the NB make, the make wrapper. Um, this is a little shell script that is generated by build.sh and it sets all the make variables you need in order to uh, build just that one component into the correct directory, into the correct objector with all the right compiler options, with all, this, all the same make flags and everything. Um, so you just run, run this, run depend all. Depend all generates the .d dependency file so the bake will track, uh, the, you know, if you change a header file, it will keep, keep track of that when, uh, when you build, rebuild the .c file, it uses the header file. And then uh, uh, install will put it into the dester. And once you've done that, you can test again straight from the truth. So I often have two terminals side by side. One terminal with, uh, with, uh, that's in this, in this um, uh, use it at bin find directory or whatever, just with depend all, install, depend all, install, iterate that. The other terminal I have in a chroot and I run ATF test, ATF run, ATF report. Uh, and uh, that's, that's why I iterate development. Plus one other you know, Emacs window open to uh, edit the source code. Um, the, uh, each program or library has its own little make file. These are very small make files. They, um, if you're not familiar with BSD development, uh, the, these make files usually just say, this is a program. It has the source files a.c, b.c, c.c. And it's called foo, and that's it. That's, that's all the make file says. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to write these big, long, elaborate make files uh, that have rules for everything and all the details spelled out. This is very, a very simple declarative system, so it's often easy to track what's going on in, uh, uh, in, in, in these make files. Uh, very easy to, easy to keep them up to date and edit them. Uh, you can find some documentation uh, in the bsd.readme file. Um, a note, if you change a header file, uh, you might spend a lot of time rebuilding a program that uses it, running the test and finding this doesn't make any difference. Why is this not changing anything? And that's because the header files are um, taken from the destitor, and if you change a header file, you have to reinstall it into the destitor before programs will use it. Um, so this is done with the make includes target. Uh, this applies whether it's in source slash include or source slash sys slash sys, where the uh, kernel header files are. Um, so this is, a, this is a common mistake that I, I, I have made. Uh, why is this still calling the wrong function? I, I had the pound define do it dif differently. Uh, oh, I forgot to do make includes. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about device drivers. So there's two kinds of things that we usually mean when we call, when we say device drivers in BSDs. Um, there are uh, autoconf drivers, and the autoconf drivers represent hardware pieces of, of, of you know, pieces of hardware attached to your, your machine. Um, and, you know, they're, they're usually, they're arranged in a tree, so you usually have some, you know, main bus that has some PCI buses hanging off it, maybe an ACPI device tree underneath that, and each PCI bus might have some devices attached to it, and there might be some other PCI PCI buses attached to it, and you know, so there's this tree of physical hardware devices. Some devices are, some hardware systems have directed acyclic graphs instead. Uh, if you look at some ARM single board computers with various um, you know, system on chips systems with various power domains, and it can, can get more complicated, but um, the point is autoconf drivers represent uh, uh, physical hardware devices that serve some function to the system's operation. Um, many of them don't have any uh, interface to user land. Many of them are just like you know, clock devices that the kernel has to flip bits on in order to make some other device work. Um, whereas uh, you've probably also seen slash dev nodes in the file system in user land. This is an interface between a user land program and a kernel. Like slash dev slash audio is the interface that userland programs use to record and play back audio out speakers and microphones uh, in your, your system. Now, the actual speaker and microphone uh, might be, you know, a, a, an HD audio device or a, um, you know, a sound blaster device. Um, but this is exposed to userland through a slash dev node called slash dev slash audio. So th these, these are both sometimes called device drivers. Um, but there are two, two separate concepts that, you, that you, you, have to, you have to think about when, when, you're, when you're writing something. Uh, so are you talking to a physical hardware device or are you exposing an interface between user land and kernel usually to a hardware device, but not always? Sometimes they correspond, but sometimes not. 
sometimes, you know, slash dev slash WD0. This is the um, ATA disk zero. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward correspondence between a slash dev node and a physical hardware device. But in the case of slash dev slash audio, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence here. The audio device, there's a mixer in the kernel that will actually combine uh, audio from different sources, different sinks, whatever, um, the physical hardware. So an autoconf driver um, usually has a couple of parts. Uh, there's going to be a uh, device uh, soft C. This is uh, the, 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 the software state for handling a physical hardware device. Um, this usually has a uh, pointer to the uh, device T object. This is just a software abstraction that is used in, in autoconf. You use it to you know, print messages that are formatted the right way to say this came from the device foo. Uh, you use it to um, uh, get references to a device if you need to reach across the device uh, autoconf tree. Um, uh, then there will be some other software state, like a, you know, maybe software a mutex lock in order to serialize access to some of the other members. Maybe there will be um, a, uh, a bus space region if you want to map registers from a physical hardware device. You can peek and poke the, 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 the hardware device's interface. And then you have a CF attached decal. Um, CF atta excuse me, CF attached decal two underscore new. Somebody went a little overboard with adding variants to the CF attached macro. Someday we'll switch to C99 designated initializers and make this a little easier to read. But um, this just says uh, here is a, an autoconf device uh, that has the following, uh, the following uh, 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 routines to match, attach, and detach. And it has, requires a state that is the size of a foo dev soft C. I, I don't know offhand where the term soft C came from. There might be someone in this room who does, um, but uh, I'll have to leave it at that for now. It's just soft C means this is state for a, a device driver. Um, the main parts of, the main active parts of an autoconf driver are um, the match, attach, and detach routines. Uh, the match function uh, takes, um, uh, arguments from whatever bus you've configured this device to be on, and this, this goes in, in, in the, the config file uh, for the kernel. Um, and it determines, uh, does, um, uh, 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 can this driver, driver handle this device? Is, does, it, you know, does it have PCI IDs that this driver recognizes? Is it the right kind of PCI device? Or does it have an FDT compatible string, or open framework compatible string that this, this driver recognizes? Uh, and if so, uh, by what priority should it attach? So sometimes we have like a generic USB class of devices, and there are some gizmos from you know Acme USB widgets Inc. that uh, have a m richer interface to the hardware, but also the generic class. The driver for the Acme widget should ha attach with a higher priority than the generic one because it can take advantage of that. So the the match routine has some prioritization mechanism, and but mostly it's just to say, does this you know does, do I recognize this this device? Um, the attach routine allocates resources, um, connects it up to other kernel interfaces, uh, and maybe scans for children. Like if you have a PCI uh, device that has a PCI bridge in it, um, well, you've got to scan for more PCI devices on the PCI bridge. Um, and the detach routine is the trickiest part of things. Uh, it also gets least attention usually because uh, you get really excited when you plug something in and holy cow, it works! And then you want to announce that. But if you unplug it, well, it doesn't work anymore because it's unplugged, right? Also because your kernel crashed because you released the resources wrong because you didn't watch the talk I gave at your BSDCon last year. And so you should, you should uh, take a look at that if you, if you want to write um, uh, detach routines. Uh, You've got to be careful about when you can free resources from a device driver if any user land programs still have them in use, potentially. Uh, and then there's a complicated dance you have to have to do to, to make sure everything is right. We we we're working uh, on making it easier, um, and uh, so it's it, we've made a lot of improvements in FPSD 10. There'll be more in FPSD 11. Um, you can watch, look at the look at the slides uh, slides there for um, uh, more more tips on detach routines. Now a slash dev node. This is a user land kernel interface. Sometimes it can it corresponds to a physical hardware device. Sometimes it's a purely software kernel abstraction that's just there to let the user land talk to the kernel in a certain way. Um, and uh, this uh, is implemented by a cdev switch uh, uh, table. Um, this is, uh, this provides the, 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 the device driver provides the functions that are called when uh, you, when user land opens a, you know, slash dev slash foo, when it issues a read or write, a close, um, and what have you. 
The CF driver and dev to unit parts are um, new in NetBSD 10. They have to do with making it easier to write correct detach routines. Uh, and uh, you, can, you, can, you can see the other, the other talk, the other slides uh, for more information on those. Um, you also have to uh, uh, update the device majors to assign a number uh, because device slash dev nodes are, are really identified by number between Usland and the kernel in that BSD and traditionally in Unix. I know in FreeBSD, there's this DevFS thing um, that works differently, uh, but that is uh, for a different talk. Now, there's a couple of different kinds of uh, slash dev nodes. There's traditional ones and there's cloning devices. Uh, traditional slash dev nodes are usually designed for things that correspond to actual physical hardware devices. And cloning devices are usually things that, uh, where there's per open software state. So if two processes open the same cloning device, they get independent state. So in the audio, um, dev audio devices, the virtual mixed audio interface, um, each process that opens it, or each, each file descriptor that you, that you, that you or each file instance that you, you get each time you open it, you get a separate uh, you know, buffer of audio that will get mixed together with all the other ones. Uh, and there's separate you know, configuration options and, and so on. Um, similarly, in the graphics rendering interface, dev DRI card zero, um, each, uh, each, uh, each, ob each open will have a different set of graphics buffers that are allocated in, in, that, uh, in that open. Um, same thing with a similar thing with like dev VHCI. This is a virtual USB host controller interface. You can use this to write software that pretends to be a USB uh, device and uh, it talks to USB kernel drivers as if they were real USB hardware plugged in. Um, and you, you know, keep your own state with that. Um, for a cloning device, uh, the C dev switch looks a little bit different. You only implement the open function and you implement a collection of file ops for uh, the file descriptor. Um, and it's the file ops where you pass in the read, write, and mmap, and whatever functions. There's a little more flexibility in, the, in these. It's also more work to implement them, so it's only if you actually need per open state that you, uh, uh, that you use these. The open function has to do a, little, a funny little dance with FD alloc file, FD clone, and the really bizarre error no code called emovefd. You just have to do this dance, this is how it works, this is the interface. It's kind of ugly, but th this is what you do. <clears throat> now, if you're running a, a, a device driver that talks to um, uh, physical hardware, almost always what you'll, what you'll get for the physical hardware is a, like, let's say you're looking at the vendor documentation, if you have it, if you're lucky enough to have vendor documentation, which you know, I'm always happy when I do, um, You'll, you'll see like a register map that says, okay, the de this device is, is mapped at this location and the following registers are available. Now, a register here is a location in memory sort of that you can write to and read from when it doesn't remember what you wrote to it and read that back. Instead, it has some interesting effect on the device. Uh, you, you write to the eject button and the, 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 and the cup holder pops out of your, of your, of your laptop. Um, no, I guess most of these laptops don't have cup holders anymore, do they? Uh, <laughs> Um, and even, even, even reading from a register can uh, have an interesting side effect. Uh, so these are, um, you know, there's very special locations in memory. Um, the software abstraction for this in NetBSD is bus space. And so if you are writing a driver on, say, a PCI driver, um, you can, you get from the PCI base address registers, uh, you can map some bus space. And the PCI base address register says, okay, this device has uh, the interface that you found in the vendor documentation at this address. And in order to get to it, you need to map this into kernel virtual address space. And then uh, you the documentation tells you what happens when you write to or read from offsets in that block. Uh, bus space uh, takes care of mapping into virtual address space and also takes care of any, uh, any um, uh, well, variation in the types of access. It's not always memory on x86 systems. There's also special IO instructions, in B, out B, in W, out W. Um, mostly just legacy devices use these, but bus space takes care of the difference. Like VGA is sometimes accessible either through uh, memory out IO registers or through IO ports. And bus space uh, just covers up this abstract with an abstraction. So you don't have to worry about it. You just, you just, um, you just pass, pass uh, offsets and, uh, and, and it figures out what, what, the, what the right thing is. Um, it also uh, it, uh, issues all the necessary barriers uh, in case you're on a machine like Alpha where 
the uh, IO or well, memory access doesn't know whether the memory is mapped as IO or not, and so you actually need to issue an explicit barrier each time in order to get the ordering of uh, IO operations uh, the same as the program order, which is, is almost always what you want in device drivers. Um, when you're working with registers, often you'll find, uh, device registers, often you'll find in, in the hardware manual a big table of um, fields in a device register. You'll see, oh, bits zero through three are the configuration index, bit five is the enable bit, bit six is the interrupt enable bit, bit seven is the, the. Um, when you're writing a NetBSD driver, you can use the handy uh, bit or bits macros to get a bit field that represents exactly a, a contiguous sequence of, 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 of bits as you just found in the hardware documentation. I took this uh, from the uh, rock chip crypto uh, engine documentation. I just went line by line, transcribed the table down with these fields. And then with uh, shift in, uh, you can uh, give a value for a field and the bit mask for that field, and it puts that value in the position of that bit mask. Um, similarly, with uh, shift out, uh, you can take a, um, uh, a register and a field for that register, and it will correct, compute the correct shifting and masking to pull out exactly that field. So it's very handy to uh, write down uh, fields like this. It doesn't seem like a lot that this is just another notation for writing down fields, but this is a huge improvement in terms of development time over writing down, oh, bit position 16, let me shift by 16 bits to the right and then mask with 0x3ff. Um, this, this is a, it, it, it's a small thing, but it's really nice for writing device drivers. Um, try to introduce it wherever I can. Um, now, some devices uh, will um, uh, use DMA where, you know, in principle, when you want to transfer data from a user buffer, let's say a user, you're writing, let's say you're writing a driver for a network card and you have uh, data you want to send out to the network uh, from uh, some buffer in user land. Well, one thing you could do is write a, a, a program that goes in a loop and reads a byte out of the user land buffer and writes a byte to a hardware register and then reads a byte from the user land buffer, writes a byte to the hardware register and so on until you've written every byte of the packet and then you write another hardware register saying, send this packet please. This is something that there are some devices to do that. Uh, some devices use that interface, but it's very slow because the CPU is not actually very fast at moving bits from memory to devices. Um, instead, uh, many devices will use DMA, direct memory access, where uh, what you do is you program some addresses into the DMA controller in, say, your Ethernet NIC, and uh, then say, okay, go, and instead of asking the CPU to do anything, the, DM, the Ethernet controller will, the Ethernet NIC will just ask the DMA controller to copy bits directly from memory and bypass the CPU altogether. Um, so uh, with the bus DMA abstraction in FBSD, uh, this provides a way to allocate buffers that are always safe to put the addresses of into uh, DMA controller registers. Um, and uh, it will deal with IOMMU, that is, uh, um, uh, if it's supported in the architecture, that is, um, uh, it will deal with um, uh, uh, limiting uh, the device's view of memory to only certain subsets of physical memory, just like MMU, memory management unit, uh, virtual memory works in user land processes to limit a user land's view of memory to just the physical pages that it's allowed. Uh, and bus DMA will also handle bouncing if necessary. That is, if you want to send a packet out from a user land buffer that doesn't meet some constraints of the hardware, maybe it's not in contiguous physical pages. Maybe it is, you know, it, it straddles an alignment boundary. It, it straddles a 256 byte boundary and it, it, the device can only handle uh, within, you know, uh, transfers that are within uh, a multiple of 256. Um, then bus DMA will handle mem copying that to a temporary buffer that is safe for DMA and passing it through. So device drivers don't generally have to worry about a lot of these details. You can just use bus DMA to, um, uh, to, to get the right parameters for uh, initiating a DMA, DMA transfer. Uh, now, when you're doing kernel development, um, <clears throat> whether it's for a, uh, well, device for some device drivers, depending on the device driver, like USB ones, you can generally do this. PCI ones, not at the moment. Um, but for other kernel components, uh, 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 like the, you know, um, uh, you know, the allocator or, or, or other things, um, uh, uh, 
uh, thread synchronization primitives, file systems. Um, there's a system called RUMP, uh, short for Runnable User Space Metaprograms. Uh, RUMP is a, um, a, a, a tool chain and uh, set of APIs for taking unmodified kernel components and exposing them as user land libraries. So you can have a user land program that calls into the uh, UFS, FFS file system implementation and the VFS uh, layer so that it can uh, take a regular file on disk, a uh, regular file on your file system, and run the FFS file system on that file as a file system image, uh, and it all in user land. And we use this extensively uh, in our automatic testing, uh, especially for file systems, but also many other parts of the kernel. Um, so that there's a you know, test program, we'll say, we'll create a, uh, you know, just, just enough kernel state to run the file system and run the file system to, you know, do some tests, uh, create some directories, hammer on it with rename, do, you know, rename is the worst system call, the worst file system call, um, it's a huge pain. Uh, and, and so we, we, use, we, use, we use this extensively for testing. Um, so you can edit, compile, and test kernel components from user land uh, just by running nbmake, the make wrapper, in the uh, rump directory, and then run the tests that use that. Um, and if you look through uh, uh, the test directory, you'll find a lot that are using uh, that are, are using Rump. You can just look at how they work. It's it's usually pretty easy to, to see what's going on with them. Um, and uh, if you want to build other tests, uh, then then you can you can easily iterate development on kernel components uh, this way. So, uh, who's uh, who's got the source code and, and finished to build that SH? <laughs> no, I, it'll probably take a little too. I don't think any laptops in here are fast enough to do that. Uh, it's, uh, the, 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 the source tree has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and, and it's, uh, more and more stuff needs to get built, um, especially with like X11, uh, which now requires LLVM to be built as part of the uh, Mesa toolchain, you know, graphics shader toolchain stack, and it takes forever. But um, anyway, uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, yes, I and usually when I'm uh, yeah usually when I, when I'm when I'm doing MCT development, I will either um, if it's you know physical hardware, then I usually test on physical hardware. But if it's, if it's not, then I will usually write a unit test, ATF test, um, and make sure that that uh, that fixes whatever problem I'm working on. Um, the problem that I find with uh, ATF is that if you have ATF run. Yes, um, so there's two ways you can deal with that. One is you can just save the output of ATF run into a file and then run ATF report on that file and it, that you will get the exit code that way. The other is you can use the, the shell option pipe fail, set dash o pipe fail, all one word. Um, and that way if any component of a pipeline fails, then the entire pipeline will fail with that. Uh, with the, if any any component of, the, of a pipeline exits with with non-zero status, then the entire pipeline will fail with some non-zero exit status. Whichever, you know, it'll, if multiple ones fail with non-zero, then it will pick one of those. But um, and I guess pipe fail is very handy for for pipelines in general for any sort of shell shell scripting. Um, we should have had it be the default many decades ago, but oh well. Another question. <sighs> How big is the kernel source? Um, well, that depends on what you count as the kernel source. Um, uh, so, uh, so here's the like the core kernel. This is uh, two point four. Well, uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. So lines of code. So this is about uh, uh, half a million. Um, which, which, what is this? Uh, lines, words, and uh, character bytes. Okay, so about two hundred thousand lines of code in sys slash kern. Now that's the um, that's the that's the, the core of the kernel. That's that's the mandatory parts, the most mostly mandatory parts of the kernel. There's lots of other parts of the kernel too. Um, where you draw the boundary, it, you know, I don't I don't know where you where you want to draw that boundary. Uh, to illustrate why I'm uh, uh, um, uh, being wishy-washy about this, let's see. Um, uh, let's look at the AMD GPU code. Um, 
And how many lines do we have in that? Uh, so this is uh, 2.3 million lines of code in the AMD GPU driver. However, a huge fraction of that is actually just copied and pasted register definitions in .h files, most of which do not get used. So um, it's, uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm not sure at what, you know, what level you want, you want to ask this. Uh, Uh, right, so, well, so if you want, if you want memory management, you've got to look at UVM. Um, sorry, I, I should repeat for the video audience. The question was, how big is the NetBSD kernel source code? Um, and uh, yeah, the answer is complicated. So, um, uh, so like UVM file systems um, and kernel, uh, uh, so that ends up being about half a million lines of code, I guess. Um, except I should include libkern as well, uh, which is not much more, but a little bit more. Um, well, I, I added the virtual memory system and all the file systems. Yeah. So, so initially, I just gave you sys slash kern. Um, so anyway, this is, you, you can use this to, to count if you want. Uh, this is this is how I I would approach it. But. <laughs> Yes, uh, so the way that works is, well, most of the, the code is not very Linux specific. Um, uh, you know, most of it is just, yeah, most of it is, you know, AMD GPU specific, but the, and then uh, it, it, a lot of it is a very large number of register reads and writes to do magic sequences to set things up uh, in the GPU. Um, and there's a, there, then there's a, a shim layer of uh, Linux kernel API to get the DRM uh, graphics drivers running in NetBSD um, without much modification. There's still a lot of mo local patches, but with, you know, without much modification. Yes, a set of wrappers run like the Linux Mutex API, the Linux, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, Kalloc API, KZ alloc API, Linux, you know, Linux memory allocators, Linux uh, um, uh, PCI interface, et cetera. Um, and that is, it's another, it's a, it's, a, it's a big project and that's a subject for a different talk, but, um, but yeah, uh, happy to talk more about that if you, if you like, uh, just after this, is, uh, after this is over. Any uh, other questions? Uh, yes. Do you, do you think some of the practical analysis on the kernel code relates to the The question is, do we use any static analysis on the kernel code? And the answer is um, uh, yes, we do have some uh, systems with static analysis. Uh, we sometimes run the Clang static analyzer. Sometimes run Coverity. Um, the Coverity was actually not running for a few years. Uh, we used to use it a lot. Um, we used to look at it a lot. I mean, we don't use it because it's proprietary. I don't know how that even works, but someone runs it. Uh, and then someone started running it again just a month or so ago. And uh, it's, um, it, it sometimes finds issues. Lately, it's been mostly false positives. Um, and, uh, and you know, we, we also run the compiler with a lot of warnings enabled, uh, and we, we generally pay attention to those warnings, especially when we do a compiler updates. Um, we're working on GCC 12, uh, but it's, the, it's slow going. Um, and I guess we'll have to do GCC 14 at some point soon. Um, other questions? All right. Well. I uh, hope we haven't totally overwhelmed the Wi-Fi by uh, everyone trying to download the source code all at once, but <laughs> uh, thank you. <clears throat>